fiction. So how do these guys write what they know? Alright, let's get away from that. So here comes the story. This is not Westwood Lake, this is Christina Lake. And this is Richard and Carolyn's place. And the first excerpt I will read you comes when we leave there and try and cross the border. On the morning we left Richard and Carolyn, buffalo steaks fell off the menu. It happened while I was brushing my teeth. The toothpaste made a sound it shouldn't have made on the way into the sink. I usually associate the onomatopoeia of clunk with substances much harder than toothpaste. And in this particular instance, the laws of nature held. I opened up my mouth and angled the light so as to illuminate the great hole where the clunk used to be. It was so dark, it was like three feet into a wolf. <laughs> well, that's a trip down the drain, said Robin. There's still huckleberry pie, I said. We'll find a dentist in Idaho. I looked over at Richard. He had that you should go before something else breaks look. <laughs> Robin and I fired up the wagon in each other's enthusiasm and headed south to the Laurier Crossing. But we were almost out of gas and missed the last chance to fill up before the frontier loomed up too large too soon. Our eagerness jumped the red light at the border booth. You're supposed to wait until it turns green, said the sunglasses. I looked around for bloodhounds. Purpose of your visit to the United States, he asked. I almost shared my need for a dentist. We're searching for the American West, I said, and watched a frown begin to form. I want to see Montana, Robin added in her Kiwi accent. The frown went away. You all enjoy your visit, he said. How far to the next gas station, I asked. Indians have a place about 10 miles along, he said, and waved us through. Wow, I thought. Not a minute into the Wild West, and we're already on our way to meet our first Indians. <laughs> So we went to the Moise Buffalo Range, uh, and didn't see any buffalo, but we saw some. Uh, and then we climbed a mountain into a ghost town called Garnet, on a very steep road where we almost fell off into the abyss, and then found a whole parking lot full of RVs and trailers that had come up using the highway. <laughs> I heard about that one for a while. <laughs> this is the most poisonous, uh, body of water in the North American continent, so Berkeley Pit in Butte, Montana. I got a whole chapter on that one. And this is the Sacagawea Hotel where you have to have breakfast in bed, or else. <laughs> this is uh, the Lurkin Mansion in Bozeman, the last best place. And then we hit Crow territory, and that's a crow taco, <laughs> fried Indian bread, and Mexican helpings. And that's Bert's salary in Sheridan. And that is Buffalo Bill's Hotel, the Occidental. In downtown Buffalo, Wyoming, and the Buffalo, Wyoming is no relation to Buffalo Bill. It's actually named after Buffalo, New York. But it's where the second extract that I'm going to read you comes from. The Occidental Hotel has a, has a restaurant called The Virginian. And I went downstairs, there wasn't anybody in it. <clears throat> so I went back upstairs to get my lovely assistant. <laughs> no one was eating in The Virginian. I went back upstairs to get Robin. Quieter than a mouse chewing cotton, I said. What about that steakhouse we saw on the other edge of town, she said. So we went there. Beyond the wild mustangs and cattle and cowboys on the mural near the bridge, Buffalo, Wyoming, a creek runs through it. It was called the Winchester, and the parking lot was full. Inside was the kind of noise you only hear in American restaurants, the sound of individual digging into wolves after guts, gorging on a good deal. We had to wait. The fastest way to move cattle is slowly. You must be getting hungry, said the girl who finally took us to a table. 
My belly buttons rubbed a blister on my backbone, I said. <laughs> we ordered ribeyes and mushrooms with potatoes and an iceberg salad wedge with blue cheese dressing and moose drool beer to wash it down. How y'all like your steak, she asked. I looked around. Lop off the horns and the tail, put it on a plate, I said. And we waited with anticipation to experience what had brought all these other Wyoming gourmets to town. It didn't go well. We were two moose drools down the road before the food cut up. Everything was as big as the country, but the potatoes tasted of powder and process packaging. The mushrooms tasted of tin. The blue cheese dressing had drowned the lettuce wedge, but it may have been an act of mercy. I detected a strong odor of bovril. The only thing fresh was a beer glass that Robin asked to be replaced because it was dirty. It came hot, fresh out of the dishwasher. <laughs> My ribeye tasted like it had been salvaged from one of the taxidermy torsos on the wall of the Occidental Saloon. And it came with an unexpected bonus. What's that? asked Robin. I looked down at a filiform foreign body in my meat. Then I I said. We called over the waitress. What's that? I asked. Then I she said. She called over the manager. Then they went away to decide. We think it's a noodle, she said on returning. You don't have noodles on your menu, Robin said. She offered to bring me another ribeye, but I was full. So we ain't going back. This is the, the medicine wheel at the top of a mountain in uh, Wyoming. And then you drop literally 4,000 feet to the bottom here. Sometimes, sometimes we just knew we were in the American West. So this is, this is a, a memorial commemorative to us, uh, Chief Joseph, Nez Pierce migration, Trail of Tears. We went through, uh, had the fortune or misfortune to go through Yellow, uh, Yellowstone when uh, they had the retrenchment of the U.S. Um, Civil Service. So there were uh, literally busloads of Japanese people who weren't allowed off to use the facilities. And uh, they, were, they got into trouble for trying to recreate, whatever that was. <laughs> so we had a little swim in Yellowstone. We went to Jackson. And then we arrived in Ketchum, and they had the parade. So, I need to explain this a little bit. <laughs> because that's my lovely assistant on the right. The guy on the left, I had met a little earlier. And I'll tell you how that went. This is your third installment. My paper plate was heavy with pancakes and sausages and bacon and eggs, and the orange juice in my other hand was searching for a place to land. All the picnic tables in the square were full, except for the one directly ahead of me. Only one man sat eating breakfast there in the dappled light but I could see why he had it all to himself. So old, he was old west. Under his oversized gray felt Stetson was a bushy white beard and a penetrating set of clear blue eyes. He wore a leather vest with a marshal's flat badge, a blue bandana and the same striped shirt, blue jeans and boots as the cowboy clones. I approached cautiously. Is anyone sitting here? I asked. <laughs> you see anyone? He said. <laughs> You can always tell a cowboy, but you can't tell him much. He motioned me to take a seat. How old are you, I asked. Older than the mountains and twice as much dust, I said. I've seen 80 go by. I told him I thought that was pretty old. It's not about how fast you run or how high you climb, he said. It's about how you bounce. <laughs> Out here you live a long time. Even horse thieves have to hang five minutes longer than anywhere else. <laughs> I introduced myself. Ivan Swanner, he said. Pleased to meet your acquaintance. But his gnarled handshake told me he was less pleased than I was until Robin arrived with Anne and Ivan lit up. <laughs> Ivan, you got breakfast on your mustache, Anne said. Ivan's our local raconteur, historian, and man about town. Too old to set a bad example, but old enough to give good advice. He went to school in a one room schoolhouse and remembers when going south for the winter meant twin falls and when skis were snowshoes used by the ladies to get around town. He was a deputy sheriff of Ketchum for 14 years. They used to call him 
Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> Ivan wiped his beard. Sit down, he said to him. And then he started his mustache, dancing with the food and the telling of it. So, these were the wagons that groaned and croaked around. You see the horses pulling them off in the other direction, that's how heavy these things are. And they came around the main street. And right in the middle of the second wagon was Ivan. Did you ever meet Hemingway, Ivan? I asked. I used to drink with him, he said. How was that, I asked. He was better. <laughs> Did he talk about much, I asked. Liquor talks mighty loud, but it gets loose from the jug, he said. But you can't drown your sorrows, they know how to swim. <laughs> how come you survived he didn't, I asked. I stayed on the wagon, him fell off, he said. I asked Ivan what he thought of the man. Some people thought he was a son of a, he said. I thought he was a very good guy. You know he won a Nobel Prize in Literature, I asked. That may have happened, said Ivan, but I ain't got no recollection of it. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got into the country, <coughs> uh, way into the country. Up the salmon, the, 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 the fires were raging, so we decided to go right into them. And then we went to Silver City, which is another chapter. <laughs> There's Silver City, shown by a point. And we stopped in Boise, Idaho, where we met Barefoot Thomas. We went to the rodeo in Lewiston. And this is Randy Priest. He played God in a movie called Ibid. But I didn't buy a hat. <laughs> we went to 